Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul with TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new World of Warships gameplay today on our channel. In this episode we're setting sail in the tier 6 Japanese torpedo boat destroyer known as the Fubuki in a tier 7 domination game on the Mount Estuary. As we're joined by our good friend Nick who's staying out in the Japanese cruiser known as the Alba, the purpose of today's gameplay is for us to analyse a match in which we put the traits of the Fubuki to good use. And you can see this as a pseudo review of the Fubuki in a way, but there's a greater focus on the tactics I employ here. Now immediately when we think of torpedo boat destroying the Japanese line, there's two key characteristics that come to light, stealth and torpedoes. And let's start with the obvious one, the stealth. This ship is going to be well concealed particularly when you have the concealment expert captain skill at tier 4, whereby your detectability by sea as exhibited on screen today is 6.1km and by air 3.4km. This means compared to the opposition I'm going up against, particularly the tier 7 American destroying the enemy team known as the Mayhan, I'm going to have a concealment advantage and I need to use that to the greatest possible effect. It will enable me to control when I see the enemy destroyers for my teammates, and that's where ambushing each other around the corner, but in open waters I will give my team the initiative in being able to fire first against the enemy destroyer typically. In return, this brings us on to one of our weaknesses and where we need to use our stealth to our advantage. Our artillery compared to our aggressors, even the tier 5 Podvorsky, the Russian destroyer on the enemy team, our artillery is lacklustre. As we only pack two twin turrets, one mounted towards the front, one towards the rear, they're 127mm in calibre, and whilst we do considerable high explosive damage with a maximum of 1800, we have an 8 second reload, I meaning that even if we're successful at hitting our targets with our good accuracy, I a dispersion of 94 meters and a maximum range of 11.5 kilometers, we just do not have the raw damage output per minute in order to be able to rip apart the destroyer as quickly as they can rip us apart one of us only having a total health pool of 12,900 without survivability expert, the next captain skill I wish to get. So in return as we're now spotted by the Podvioski, note how we spotted them much earlier and our team got the initial salvos out. Now I'm not expecting our cruisers to be able to decimate this destroyer at such a distance, I say 10km plus, but it puts pressure on that destroyer to start retreating or considering moving away, and this means they lose attention on the fact there may be a load of torpedoes in the water from my ship, and by the time they've realised that, it's going to be too late. As we pick up our first kill. Now it hasn't been a flawless start, and if anything it's been a very violent one because I've had to lose approximately just over two thirds of my health in order to be able to pick up a kill on a lower tier destroyer. But now the possibilities start to open up, and this is where we start to use the torpedoes of this ship even more effectively compared to what we just saw. Because the thing you have to consider with these torpedoes is what if you have three triple sets mounted amidships, they have 10km range, a top speed of 59 knots and can do a maximum damage output of 16,267 HP. It is the fast reload of these torpedoes, particularly with the torpedo arm and expertise captain skill at tier 3 that makes them so dangerous. Whereby our reload here is 68.4 seconds and we can make that even faster with adrenaline rush at tier 2 in the captain skill tree. We don't have that here but that's another one I'll be investing in towards the end of my 19 point grind. And in return it means we can start to prey on the ignorance of both sides. Now what do I mean by this? Well note that I've targeted the enemy Nagato, the tier 7 Japanese battleship, a key ship in this engagement whereby they're busy engaging our friendly ships including Nick, and in return my teammates are engaging the enemy fleet. Both sides are perhaps ignorant of the fact there could be destroyers in open water right now and they wouldn't know none the wiser, because both sides are spotting each other through indiscriminate fire. And by using my torpedoes to prey on the Nagatos, a lack of overall attentiveness, it means as they come out behind the landmass here, they haven't changed direction, and I've provided a little bit of spread over the triple sets to make sure if they do change speed, my torpedoes still have the ability to strike, and it means they're going to hit the target and rip it out of the sea. And within the space of under 4 minutes, we've already eliminated one of the key battleships on the enemy team meaning that we can now start to pressure the enemy team through Objective Delta, having captured it in the meantime. But here we have to consider that it's not important to take on the Remnant cruisers, because note that they have a Nuremberg and an Algerie, and these are kiting cruisers in my experience. Now what do I mean by kiting? When short, these are cruisers that are very good at harassing in retreat, either they continually open fire on your teammates and yourself whilst you're trying to pursue them as they're relatively fast, highly manoeuvrable and lack the overall armour to go toe to toe with your battleships and your heavier cruisers. 
so instead particularly in the Nuremberg will try to turn their rear guns towards you and continuously dump down fire and in return take minimal damage. Of course our Texas or Congo could get lucky with a single salvo or a well aimed salvo and do absolutely brutal damage to those cruisers, but the chances are slim at such engagement distances, I mean here we're looking at approximately 16 kilometers at least. So instead, what we decide to do is not worry about those cruisers, because we want to draw them into the fight against our battleships, but we need to prowl the fact that this is a domination game. So what's important in a domination game? Take objectives. And with the enemy destroyers looking at the minimap so engrossed on taking objective alpha by the looks of things, as they still have a Mayhan and also a Fushin, we're going to at least bring equal arms to my ship, if not superior arms in terms of artillery power, it means that objective Charlie is for the taking. So why don't I just start making my way over there? And of course I'm on a team speak chat to Nick and I'm saying to him at this point over microphone, look our role is not to take out these cruisers south of Delta because they're only going to waste our time. Instead let's move towards the middle, harass the Patan that's trying to make its way through the middle, i.e. the tier 5 French battleship, and just start to secure the objectives. Because the enemy team, the main force, is still struggling to take Alpha, they've only just started capturing it fully. And we can see through the markers on the minimap that the destroyers are indeed there and they're engrossed in engagement so they mean that the enemy team has no visibility of what's going on towards Charlie right now. Now I'm getting ready to potentially launch torpedoes if the Nuremberg comes back but I'm in no rush to deploy these torpedoes simply because I'd rather get to Charlie and start taking it because the logic behind this is once I start taking Charlie the enemy team has to deduce the only thing that could be taken that under our noses right now i.e. not being spotted must be that Fabuki that's still alive because I'm the only destroyer left on our team so I'm going to be using the enemy team's awareness or knowledge of what ships our team have to our advantage by forcing them to come to terms with situations or at least that's my intention of course in having a 35 knot top speed more on that in a second, that also means we could potentially chase down the Pratan, but that's not too important. Now one of the issues you will have in the Fabuki is its lack of top speed. I that 35 knots is nice compared to cruisers and battleships, but it suffers compared to destroyers you can face, which are starting to push towards 38 knots if not more. Therefore this is not a ship that can outright pursue destroyers down. And even with your speed boost and the speed flag, or I never use speed flags personally, you'll have difficulty in getting up to maximum possible speeds by heading towards the 40 knots line. So instead we're going to smoke an objective Charlie, and what we're going to try and do at this point is bait the enemy team to come towards Charlie. Now we're not going to be using our guns because we don't want to give away our position in the smoke, as if the enemy Nuremberg is a smart player they may try to open fire in our smoke and rip us to pieces through guesstimation, and if they do, then we lose our health and it means that we are restricted in what tactics we can deploy, noting already that we're in a difficult situation with our lack of health. Now here I make a misplay, have you guessed what it is yet? Nope, well look at what I've done with my torpedoes and look at the minimap. I didn't take into account the fact that our shores was pushing so aggressively after the Batan, potentially trying to use their 4km torpedoes to devastate that battleship. So as a result of that, the Shores is going to be rushing across the path of my torpedoes. Now in retrospect perhaps I should have typed into chat torpedoes incoming Shores, but I didn't realise the Shores was there at the time, and this goes against one of the key rules that I always play with with destroyers, never torpedo behind your teammates, and here it's my ignorance of not being aware of what the Shores was doing. I'm to blame if the Shores takes a torpedo hit from one of my own. Now fortunately it is going to be the case that the enemy Colorado takes out the shores before it's too late, so I'm grateful for the enemy team killing them off because I didn't want to pick up the team kill, but there's always a lesson to be learned with on your mistakes and I'm going to take that one into the next game I play in the ship. But coming back to tactics, remember what we did with the Nagato earlier? We're going to do the same with the Colorado now. Now whilst they're not engrossed in an engagement, what I'm thinking is they're going to rush to come round the corner. The reason for this is they want to get stuck into the fight against our Texases that are making their way into Charlie. Now of course I can't be 100% certain of what the Colorado is going to do which is why I provided the spread around the corner, so if they decide to take it tight they're going to take the rightmost set of torpedoes on their bow and at least take one I hope, but I've also overlapped the torpedoes so that way if they do sail around broadside it's going to be another kill strike, I take them out of the game completely. Now at this point what I have to realise as well is just because I've been on the front line for the first half of this game or the first 9 minutes of this game doesn't mean I have to be on the front line all the time and sometimes the front line shifts and I've noticed the enemy destroyers are making their way towards Bravo and I'm saying to Nick at this point we need to react to this because once we eliminate the destroyer threat this game is completely ours or at least if it goes to the wire I can start just running around capturing points underneath the enemy's noses. 
Now we do pick up a torpedo hit on the Colorado, fortunate that, and we score some flooding. Unfortunately the flooding is not going to stick, but it means that Colorado's no longer got access to their damage control party to put out subsequent fires or flooding, so that works to our team's advantage. As Nick makes his way in towards Bravo, we note that the enemy Mayhan is in there and I have to cower behind my teammate, because I just don't have the health pool or the firepower to be able to go toe to toe with that Mayhan. And the fact that I'm reckoning that the Mayhan's on a good amount of health, and it's confirmed they're on full health, means that the situation is only going to become more difficult. So what I've said to Nick is he needs to get stuck in, he needs to go for the Mayhan smoke and charge it down. Now unfortunately Nick does not have Hydroacoustic Search equipped as a concern, he has Defensive AA because of how we were playing the operations, an example of that was last week's video, the Operation Aegeus video, link available in the top right corner of your screen as displayed now. It's an easy mistake to make, we always equip the wrong consumables every so often, and Nick's just made it here. But instead he's going to go towards the objective, and what I'm going to do is head out towards the side of Nick, off to what would be his starboard side, and provide a distraction through the form of a load of smoke. Now the logic behind this is I'm hoping the Mayhem may notice the smoke rather than the Alba moving towards him and therefore be inclined to throw his torpedoes towards me. And with my rudder shift of two and a half seconds and the fact I've got my acceleration considerable active now, it means I'll be able to quickly turn my bow towards those torpedoes and dodge them when they come. With the Mayhem having some rather powerful torpedoes with a maximum range of 9.2 kilometers from what I recall if fully upgraded. But it looks as though the Mayhem is sticking to their smoke with our Leon also coming down from the northwest which means Nick's just going to have to go head to head and try to catch that destroyer and rip them to pieces. In the meantime I'm here as backup just in case Nick requires it, and shortly we're going to see that the Mayhan is spotted and Nick is going to take a good number of torpedoes, but this puts the Mayhan under undue stress. In return, the Mayhan is now in a position they cannot hold and has to start moving out, and I can start to chuck in gradual fire as Nick soaks up an entire salvo of torpedoes on his ship, well almost an entire salvo. He's already lost over two thirds of his health, but his job's been done, which is he spotted that destroyer and our Leon has been able to finish it off. And sometimes you do have to soak up the damage for your team, but Nick's done a great job there. That's the most important ship on the enemy team from my perspective, and perhaps from our team's perspective, out of the game. Because they no longer have a stealthy ship that can go from capture point to capture point and take them without harassment or revenge, and at the same time it means that from my perspective, I can now operate unhindered, as long as I don't do anything stupid, such as coming out around a corner close to the enemy Cleveland, for example, who would decimate me in a single salvo. Now as we're taking the objective back, i.e. in this case Objective Bravo, what I'm now thinking to myself is, well the game's been good so far, let's not get cocky, let's play it smart. And what I have to think at this point is what would be the obvious play? The obvious play for me would be to go towards Delta and defend against the Colorado and the Algerie who seem to be moving that way, or at least moving to take down our Congo first and then head round to Delta. So instead I'm going to go against the obvious and actually make my way directly towards Charlie. Now it's not my intention to rush down either of those ships, but what I want to do is create a dilemma for the enemy team. Because they have a grip on Alpha and Charlie, they have a Cleveland who's clearly between the two objectives, potentially moving towards Bravo, they have a battleship all the way up in the northwestern corner of the map who seems to be out of it, I believe that's a Koenig from reading on the minimap, although my eyesight's not too good. And therefore that battleship is pretty much out of the game unless they want to do any long distance fire. So the only thing the enemy team can do is either act one way or the other. They either have to divide their forces and make their way towards Delta and Charlie separately. Alternatively they have to consolidate and go towards one objective. Because they haven't got very many numbers and neither of our team. And you'll know that our team is moving as a group if you exclude the Congo in the southeast. I've thrown down the torpedoes here to just provide a buffer against the Cleveland potentially rushing in towards Bravo, although I'm not expecting them to because that would be suicidal, them confronting two battleships, a cruiser and a hidden destroyer. But as we make our way towards Charlie, what we can see is our thought has rung true, that the Colorado is moving to attack our friendly Congo, the Algerie seems to be in a position where they're not too committed to Charlie, and the Cleveland, which we just briefly spotted, is holding ground around Objective Alpha. And therefore we don't have to worry about the Cleveland, although I've marked it on the minimap to point out to our friendly battleships, look you need to be aware of this threat because of its high arcing shells and its 152mm cannon, means that it can cause a lot of damage, but we can keep moving forward. Now unfortunately Nick gets caught out in the open here thanks to the catapult fighter off the Cleveland, which means that his lifespan in this game is going to come to an end gradually, and it's a little bit unfortunate, we thought we could get him around the landmass just before that Cleveland could see him, we didn't anticipate the potency of the catapult fighter there. But nonetheless, he's firing in some shells towards the Algerie, he's given it his final gasp attempt. And what if our Congo haven't fallen down towards the southeastern corner of the map, and us moving in? 
Note that the Colorado here is making their way towards Delta. And I've also been slowing up a little bit. I haven't been taking a straight line towards Delta. Now, why is that? Well, if I went straight towards Delta and charged in there, that tells the enemy Colorado that I'm clearly in that objective and I'm taking it as fast as possible. So objective Charlie, I should say. Just realizing what I've said. So if I'd rushed into Charlie, especially with my speed boost, it would tell the Colorado, hey, look, there's a destroyer in Charlie. You've got to go deal with it. But by waiting a little bit, now the Colorado's in a sort of 50-50. Do I keep going towards Delta? Or do I go towards Charlie? Or do I let my Algerie go towards Charlie? And therefore, what we can see is the Colorado set on getting to Delta. Perhaps they're thinking I'm not going to be torpedoing them. Instead, I might be more concerned with the cruiser coming my way. Well, my 10 kilometer torpedoes would say otherwise, as I've put my on the path of taking the Colorado out if it went towards Delta at maximum speed, and it pays off. And with that battleship now out of the game, and we're about to take Charlie as well, it's now a 3 versus 3, and our team has the point advantage by a significant margin. To the point whereby, if my teammates now both die, it's not a problem, because we have 3 caps and we are accruing points at a rapid rate. Now I'm throwing down defensive torpedoes here against the Algerie charging towards Charlie. I'm not expecting these to hit, but I want them to have a different effect. I want them to push the Algerie towards Delta. I'm expecting that ship to have hydroacoustic search active right now, and it would be silly for me to charge in. But with those torpedoes being there, if the Algerie makes a beeline for me, then as a result they'll have to make a beeline through my torpedoes, and they'll need the hydroacoustic search in order to be able to see them coming. Right over the one and a half kilometer detectability by sea. So therefore, I don't have to worry about that Algerie pursuing me for the time being, as they are a fast ship, and instead I can just make my way towards Alpha, because our Texas who's just died has told me the enemy Cleveland and the enemy Koenig are both heading towards Bravo. So I've got no issue now. The Algerie is out of position to take an objective. The Cleveland, whilst they're on 5,000 health, is it really worth throwing out a salvo when I know I can't kill them off? No, nope, but my torpedoes are almost reloaded again, and that catapult fight would give me away if I opened five my artillery pieces, so let's just take our time, let's not worry about it. And what do I think the Cleveland's going to do once they've taken Bravo? Well, they'll probably come charging around the corner to try and find me on Alpha, because the only logical conclusion these enemy ships can have, particularly the Algerie, and particularly the Cleveland, is I must be at Alpha or heading that way, because I'm not spotting them all right now. So I toss my torpedoes around the corner and I make a beeline towards objective alpha and with the remnant 30 seconds of my speed boost I'll get there very quickly and it's only going to encourage the enemy ships to come investigate. And it is all going to be about staying alive as our friendly in the chat has just said, I raven 2002 ro It's all about staying alive, I don't have to kill anyone anymore, I can just be a hidden nuisance. Now this is why perhaps sometimes playing the ships such as the Fabuki can be a little bit more difficult than the more gun-ho ships such as the Farragut, the tier 6 equivalent American destroyer, because in those ships as we hit the Cleveland on a predictive path, we'll find that our guns are just as powerful as our torpedoes, or vice versa, actually our guns are more powerful than our torpedoes in the case of the Russian counterparts, i.e. the Genevni. But in this ship you have to think a little bit more about what would my opponents do, what are my team doing, where would I position myself to be at the maximum effectiveness? And whilst the enemy team has taken Bravo, I'm now just finishing off taking Alpha, and it means that even if, for some reason, the enemy team suddenly quickly took Delta, we're still going to have two caps, and with the two minutes remaining, the lead our team got is unassailable, and we don't have to worry anymore. And you'll see that what I'm doing is I'm making my way northwest, I'm essentially coming up behind the path of the Koenig from earlier, and I'm trying to make my way towards open water. And the final reason for doing this is, well, as I explained earlier, I don't want to get caught out making a stupid mistake. And the stupid mistake would be fight close range, get caught out around a corner and rip to pieces. Stay in open water. I've got a smoke charge left in case I need to use it in a panic. And I'm going to throw down the smoke here. It's just a little bit of a giggle. And the game pretty much comes to its end as the enemy team tried to take Delta. Time for the post-game stats. So a rather pleasant victory in the end. We can see that our battle performance amounted to a damage tally of 96,230 HP, and on the way we picked up three standard achievements. Two of them were devastating strikes for destroying an enemy ship with a single artillery salvo, torpedo salvo, or aircraft by causing damage to over 50% of the destroyed ship's normal health pool. In both cases it was with torpedoes, firstly the enemy Podovioski, and then we quickly followed up with the enemy Nagato. We also picked up the first blood achievement for being the first to destroy an enemy ship in a given battle, and this was the enemy Podovioski. Coming on to the team score, we can see that we topped our team in terms of base experience earned, picking up 2,355. And I would like to give a massive amount of credit to all of my teammates throughout the entirety of this game. 
particularly those that came with me to Delta at the start. The reason for this is, without my teammates, this would not have been possible, or that may not have been as visible as one would expect. Let's play it back. The open engagement of the Podvioski? The Podvioski may have not been paying too much attention to potential torpedoes in the water, with Nick and a fellow cruiser, IR Shores, opening fire on them and causing them to have to retreat, and then they got clipped by one of our torpedoes. Add to that then the continuous engagement over Delta between our fleet that went that way and the enemy fleet that went that way, then the enemy Nagato was too focused on opening fire on our teammates rather than worrying about the torpedoes that were coming round the corner towards them, meaning that we could eliminate them out of the game very quickly. And then we all followed through towards the centre of the map, meaning that I was able to take Objective Charlie from the enemy team before returning to Objective Bravo alongside Nick to get rid of the enemy Mayhem that had just taken that objective we quickly took it back and then we turned around and sealed the game by taking Objective Charlie once more and moving through towards Alpha when the rest of our team started to fall apart. It was only in the final stages did we act as an individual and that's because our team weren't around anymore, they'd all been pretty much sunk. So there's more to it than just saying alone in a Japanese torpedo boat destroyer, sometimes you do need to work with your team, perhaps not as clear cut as some teamwork may be suggesting, but you have to keep your team in mind and be visible of what your team are doing at all times, and in return, they'll support you when you need it most. Coming on to our detailed report, we have two key items to note. The first is in the team play category, whereby we accrued 260 of the total 300 capture points our team scored over the course of the match. This 87% of our team's capture point total serves to highlight my focus on the objectives throughout the game and how we could use our destroyer's concealment in order to take those objectives from under the enemy team's noses, whereby the enemy team's cruisers and battleships seemed rather hesitant to go near the capture points, particularly once their destroyers have been removed from the picture. The other key item is in the damage module category, where what we can see it was a total of zero. I like to build my destroyers, particularly the Fubuki, around the concept of taking minimal possible module damage, i.e. when I get hit, not losing my engine as quickly as some other destroyer players might, simply because I'll need my engine and I'll need my rudder in order to survive, and even if it is light AA on the ship and we're in a carrier game, I'll need that AA to potentially force some planes away over time, hence why I'm running the preventative maintenance captain skill at tier 1 and when I come around to my 19th point, I will then be investing in priority target if needs be. And finally coming on to credits and experience earned, we can see that after additions and deductions, we walked away with 250,392 silver credits and 7,173 commander experience. To conclude, hopefully today we have demonstrated the viability of using a stealthy torpedo boat destroyer such as the Fubuki as the point man for the team in a given domination match whereby this destroyer can be on the front line, acting as an intelligence gatherer and an objective point contester from the outset, using her superior concealment to spot the enemy destroyers before they spot her, and enabling her teammates to gain the initiative in being able to bring down fire on the enemy destroyers first, and once they're eliminated, she can start to operate more freely in open water in particular, using her torpedoes to advantage rather than her artillery pieces, as even the most durable battleships with the greatest torpedo reduction percentages will not be able to hold up against our very powerful torpedoes in the long term. On top of that we also saw how keeping our mind on the objectives is very important, and we could start running away and chasing down enemy ships in the corners of the map, but what net benefit is this going to give our team when the objectives are towards the centre of the map? We may pick up a kill, but we're wasting time and letting our team down the long haul. It is this focus on objective play that will enable you to thrive and really make a difference to the overall success of your team. With that, I've been TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future World of Warships videos on my channel. And for those who haven't signed up to World of Warships yet and are looking to do so today, you may do so using the link in the description of this video. Remember it's free to sign up, and you may find it a thoroughly interesting game, as I do myself. But, until next time as always, ladies and gentlemen, take care, and fair seas.